Parsha Vayikra. If you look at the first word of the Parsha, Vayikra, the Aleph is small. The Aleph is a small Aleph. And the Balatorium and the commentaries explain what is the significance of this small Aleph. It starts off basically with a Midrash. Midrash Rabbah, next week's Parsha itself, brings down like this. It says in the Midrash that Jewish school children, when they reach the age of approximately five years old, which is when Jewish children are introduced to beginning to learn and to read the Chumash, the Bible. So the custom is, the Midrash says this, this is before Sephardim, Ashkenazim, before everybody. This is from the Midrash. It's an old custom from the, from the Midrash. That the custom is to start the children off not from Bereshit, the beginning of the Torah, but from Parashat Vayikra. We give the kids to, live, to read like the opening chapter of Vayikra, and after that, then the, t the teacher begins to teach them from Bereshit, the beginning of the actual Chumash. Why? So the, the Midrash says, Yavohu tehorim, v'yaasku betehorim. Let the pure come, pure children come, and be involved with their pure breath, with pure animals, pure sacrifices. Because basically this week's Parsha starts talking about what was being done in the actual Mishkan. Last week, the end of the book of Shemot, we ended the construction of the Mishkan. The Mishkan is now erected, built by Moshe Rabbeinu. Now what? Now the activity happening in the Mishkan, which is the sacrifices. And the sacrifices have a major purpose. It's for sure to induce purity in Am Yisrael. So, because that's a pure item, and Jewish children, they have what's called, it's called Tinok Shebet Raban, Hevel Piem She'en Bochet. Jewish school children, have a pure breath which is untainted with sin. Because of that, that purity, so they should begin learning the sacrifices which are pure. It's only fitting that pure children should be involved with pure animals. There's much more depth to this, and it's hinted to in this small letter Aleph, in the word Vayikra. So what is this Vayikra? Rashi starts off the parsha explaining there are many terms in Hebrew in the holy language for speaking. We see in the Torah, for example, Vaydaber Hashem and Moshe Lemor, and Hashem spoke to Moshe. Vayomer Hashem and Moshe, and Hashem is also another term for spoke, Vayomer. And there's this week's parsha, which is something unique, special, Vayikra. Hashem called out to Moshe. Rashi brings down, of all the terms used in Hashem speaking to Moshe Rabbeinu, Vayikra is the climax. It's the most desired, it's the most beloved term that Hashem uses towards Moshe Rabbeinu is Vayikra. And the Zohar explains that Vayikra has the same letters as in Aramaic, Okir, Aleph, Vav, Kuf, Yudresh, is a rearrangement of the letters of Vayikra. And the Zohar says, the Holy Zohar says, that Hashem wanted to honor Moshe Rabbeinu by calling out to him Vayikra. The same letters of Vayikra is Okir. This was Hashem's way of honoring him by giving him this special calling out. So now, in the Chumash, every standard Chumash, you have the commentary of Rashi, and on the side you have a smaller commentary called Balaturim. Balaturim, he works a lot with connections of words. There's a word here, and you find the same word in another parsha. He makes all these types of connections. It says four times he's brought down this word in the Torah, and he makes a connection between the four places. That's how he works the Balaturim. It's phenomenal. It's beautiful because it gives you the depth behind what's hiding behind the psukim when you see connections of the same words appearing and he's on the spot showing you what they're about. So the Baba Turin, he says like this, that Moshe Rabbeinu, when he started to write the Chumash of Vayikra, and Hashem ordered him to write Vayikra Hashem and Moshe, right? Vayikra and Moshe, and Hashem called out to him, Vayikra Elav, right? And Hashem was calling out to him. So Moshe Rabbeinu felt very uncomfortable. He felt it was beneath his level. That Hashem, it was above his level that Hashem should call him Vayikar, this high, high term. He wanted to write just Vayikar. Vav, Yud, Kuf, Reish, about the letter Aleph. Why? This word Vayikar is found in the Torah when Hashem spoke to Bilam. When Hashem spoke to Bilam, the wording there is, is used as Vayikar. 
And Rashi explains that what is in Vayikra? A mikra, a chance. That for Hashem it was difficult to speak to Bilam. So he didn't speak to him like in a fixed, honorable fashion. It was, by the way, Rashi goes on to say the word Vayikar is connected to what's called a mikre layla, a nocturnal emission. An emission, a man has a sexual emission improperly. That was for Hashem, the talking to Bil'am was in that same category. That was like disgusting for Hashem to speak to, to, to Bil'am. Mm-hmm. Moshe Rabbeinu felt unworthy that Hashem should honor him, Okir, with Vayikra. He wanted to write just Vayikra. And Hashem said, no, I want to honor you. Write Vayikra. So Moshe Rabbeinu wrote Vayikra with a small Aleph. But that, what does that mean then? That there's the difference between Hashem calling out to Bilam and Hashem calling out to Moshe is this little Aleph. You have in Vayikra, Vayikar, Hashem called out to Balaam, but by chance, in a chance way, by the way, secretly without people knowing about it in a discreet manner. And Vayikra is a higher term. What's the difference between them? This Aleph. And this Aleph is written small. The terminology in the Torah of a small Aleph is called Aleph Ze'era. A small, Ze'era in Aramaic means small, Aleph. But Aleph Ze'era, Rabbi Nachman teaches, is also hinted to this concept of teaching the Jewish school children starting from Parashat Vayikra. Aleph Ze'era can be also translated as Aleph means the letter Aleph, but in Aramaic, Le'alef means to teach. Alef. Alef means to teach Ze'era, to teach the small, to teach the children. In Vayikra is hinted this custom, this idea that the Midrash brings that we start teaching the Jewish children from Vayikra. It's hinted too in the small Alef. Alef Ze'era, from here, from Vayikra, Alef we teach Ze'era, the small children. It starts from here. Okay, so what's this whole thing? It's a big thing. It's like the Torah is making a deal, making a letter small, and the, the, the children start learning from it. it it's like the Midrash are talking about it. It was a Jewish custom run down in Germany or in, the, in Ashkenazi Jewry, Sephardic Jewry, fine. But it's something the Midrash is making a deal out of it. There's something here. There's something here. And number two, Jewish school children find it dandy, but we were all once Jewish school children. Now we're no longer that. What, what's the personal connection to these ideas? So, to explain, the Jewish school children start reading from the sacrifices. What, what, where, where do the sacrifices take place? In the Mishkan. What's the Mishkan? What's the Holy Temple, the Tabernacle? What is, it made, what is the idea, the significance of the Tabernacle? It was when the Jews fell in the Golden Calf, Moshe Rabbeinu, for 40 days, 40 nights, had to activate Hashem's forgiveness. To, to, to recap a little, we know that Moshe Rabbeinu went up to heaven three sets of 40 days. The first 40 days and 40 nights is from the day of Shavuot for the next 40 days to receive the Torah, the first tablets. He came down on Yud Zayim the Tammuz. He broke the first tablets because of the golden calf. And he went up for another 40 days to do what? To ask for forgiveness. And then on Rosh Chodesh Elul, Hashem said to Moshe Rabbeinu, Salachti Kidvarecha, I forgive like you said. And now prepare a second pair of second tablets. And he came down with the second tablets on Yom Kippur. And then Hashem instructed him with the tablets now to, to, uh, to activate atonement for the Jews. Whenever they do sin, you're going to build the Mishkan. So now the Mishkan really is due to Moshe Rabbeinu's begging for forgiveness. What was he doing for 40 days and 40 nights, the middle 40 days and 40 nights? It wasn't just the verse that we see in the Torah that Hashem said, and then Moshe Benu said, Lama yecha apecha? Why are you angry, Hashem? It's very little. 40 days and 40 nights having saying over the same idea. What's going on? Moshe Rabbeinu had a lot to say for 40 days and 40 nights. What was he doing for 40 days and 40 nights? He was non-stop finding the good points of the Jewish people. Mentioning to Hashem their good points. 40 days and 40 nights, good points, because it was a severe sin. It was so severe, like we said in, in previous classes, because after having such a revelation of leaving Egypt and the Red Sea, you do this. After such an open revelation of Hashem in your life, and then you do such a terrible thing, such a such a like a, 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 an atheistic, such a slap in the face to Hashem to do a golden calf to, to submit to it, to accept it, from one extreme to the next. From of course Hashem was upset. Moshe Rabbeinu was working tirelessly, endlessly, forty days, forty nights. 
to show Hashem that the Jews are filled with good points. It's worth not to destroy them. It's worth to give them another chance. It's worth to continue with them. And that's what he succeeded in doing it. And Moshe Hashem told Moshe Ben, okay, now, as the, as the atonement, the Jews should build a Mishkan. So then, Hashem commanded Moshe Ben to tell the Jews, whoever wants to donate, can donate. The donations given towards the Mishkan, the gold, the silver, the copper, the materials, was basically the Jews reflecting how much they want to give of their good points. Because the Torah says that they were giving too much. And when the command, when Hashem, Moshe Rabbeinu sent out the order, okay, that all the Jews to donate. So the people who were set in charge of receiving the donations and seeing how much is needed for the gold, the wood, the copper, and everything, they told Moshe Rabbeinu, whoa, 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 they're giving too much. Tell them to stop. So Moshe Rabbeinu had to say stop. The idea of the Jews giving shows that they were so into showing their good point. They wanted so bad to fix, to rectify the bad did, done. They wanted to fix it by doing good, by expressing good, which came out in the donations of the materials for the Mishkan. When each Jew gave according to what his heart pushed him to donate is a reflection of their good points. All these colors of the gold, the silver, the copper is a reflection of all the good points found in the Jews. This is the idea of the Mishkan. So the Mishkan basically, thanks to Moshe Rabbeinu, who for 40 days was working to find the good points in Am Yisrael, this led to the building of the Mishkan, and from the Mishkan comes the sacrifices in Vayikra. So basically, what this means is that the school children who have a pure breath, they receive their purity from the idea of the sacrifices, which come from the Mishkan, which is due to Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu's finding the good points in Am Yisrael, which led to the Mishkan, is the root of the Jewish school children receiving their pure breath. Moshe Rabbeinu, the Zohar calls him Raya Mehemna, a faithful, Raya means a roya, shepherd. <coughs> Mehemna is faith, emuna, faithful. Raya Mehemna, a faithful shepherd. Moshe Rabbeinu is called a faithful shepherd. What's a, what's a shepherd for sheep? Sheep are what? A very passive animal. Wherever you take the sheep, <laughs> he goes wherever you take him. You pick him up, you can do whatever you want for sheep. You can, uh, they, they can slaughter him, he won't stop you. A sheep is very, very passive. And that's a shepherd. A shepherd takes care of the flock of sheep, which are very delicate. They need care. And that's how the Jewish school children are. Then wherever you put a child, you start, he can't, he doesn't know, I don't want to learn this, I don't want to have a keep <coughs> A Jewish child, a Jew, any child, you put them in education, they, 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 don't, they don't fight against, they take whatever you, you give them. When you put them in, you, you put a child in a certain school in education, that's how he grows up, like a sheep. Like a, and then that's what a shepherd is. Moshe Rabbeinu is taking care of the Jewish school children to give them the source of this pure breath. And it comes from what? Moshe's ability to build the Mishkan through finding the good points. Meaning, Jewish children receive their purity, because again, the Midrash says, shall let the pure come and be involved in pure items, to show that their purity is related to this purity, that the purity of the Jewish children emanates from the purity of the sacrifices, which comes from the Mishkan being built through Moshe Rabbeinu, faithful shepherd, the one who's able to find the good points. This is the idea. What does it mean to us? We all, at a time, were Jewish school children. We were little kids. We grew up now, but we were kids once. Age five, age six, we were more or less received some type of a Jewish education. We were taught brachas, to read the Aleph Bet, the Pesach Seder. We did it like a sheep. You put a child, you, 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 you educate him, there's a Shabbat table, there's brachas, there's a Jewish atmosphere, and we did it, fine. Afterwards, we grow up, we become more sophisticated, and I think otherwise and do what I'd like to do in life. What now? What now? Now, when I'm all alone now in life, and I'm faced with dead-end situations, and, and major, major problems that require a solution, I don't know what to do, what can I do to bypass and to make it? So this is the secret of Moshe Rabbeinu being a faithful shepherd, connected directly to the school children. Because a, a child, school, children, is the beginning of the life, is the beginning of when we were beginning in our, in our entering in the world of Torah, of, of Torah of mitzvah, of, of observance. What we can do is to reconnect to the beginning. In other words, a person now 
whatever situation he's in, can always start again, make himself like a child. Okay, I'm starting from scratch. I'm letting go. I'm going to be like a little child. Whatever the teacher tells me to do, I'll do. I have no questions. Like a little child, he doesn't ask questions. They say, say Baruch, Baruch, say Ata, Ata. He does whatever they tell him to do, like a sheep. Like a sheep, that's, that's how a child is. A person making himself into a child, he receives again this purity. And, and it comes, and, and with this purity gives him the clarity, to, the purity gives him what, what he needs in life, to, to bypass the difficulties which were created, because the person, as he got older, he saw, I don't need Moshe Rabbeinu, I don't need the Tzadikim, I don't need what I received when I was young, I'm now on my own, it's my life, let me run it. And he gets a dead-end situation, so what to do? To go back. To go back again and make yourself Aleph Ze'era, teaching a child. I'm a child now, whatever I'm taught, whatever I'm told, I'm going to do. This comes about through Moshe Rabbeinu, was able to find the good in everybody. He worked 40 days, 40 nights, to connect to find the good points in every Jew. And this ability to do that, that's a, that's a high level, to be able to find the good in everyone, gives Moshe Rabbeinu the power to be who he was, and to be able to give that over for Am Yisrael, that they can have this ability to connect to the purity of the beginning if they, if they want to again. It's up to them. But this is the message of this small Aleph. And now we said that this, is the, this little Aleph is the difference between Bil'am and Moshe Rabbeinu. Because by, again, by Bil'am it's Vayikar, and by Moshe it's Vayikra, with this Aleph. What was Bil'am? Bil'am was the exact opposite of Moshe Rabbeinu. What was Abilam? He had a bad eye. Right? Ne'um be'or setum ayin. So says Bilam, the one whose eye is closed off. He lost one eye because he, the Rashi brings down. He tried to bring in evil eye to the Jewish people. He was trying to bring in, when he said the brachas, Ma tovu alecha Yaakov, how good are your tents? And he was trying to bless the Jewish people. He was really trying to give them the evil eye. And he, Bilam, was involved in looking in the bad in other people. That was his power. He was a prophet for the, for the nations, but he was bad, specifically because he looked at the bad. And this is the exact opposite of Moshe Rabbeinu. That Moshe Rabbeinu was such a faithful shepherd that he was able to find the good in everybody. He was the one who wanted Hashem to take the Erev Rav, the mixed multitude. Hashem said, listen, I'm not telling you what to do. You want to bring them, it's up to you, it's your choice. Why did Moshe Rabbeinu have such compassion to bring in even the mixed multitude who afterwards caused the problem of the golden calf. The golden calf was mainly because of the mixed multitude because they were in a panic. No more Shabbainu, our leader is gone. We need an idol to guide us now. We need, we need an intermediary between us and Hashem who will go before us. That was the, the Erev Rav who did that. Who brought them in? Moshe Rabbeinu. Why did he bring them in then? Because Moshe Rabbeinu was a faithful shepherd. He took care of everybody like a flock. He, he was able to find the good in everybody and treat like that, they're, they're, treat them with, uh, with the care of a shepherd, like, like with little sheep. This is the value of Moshe Rabbeinu. Bilam was the exact opposite of that. But all this shows the difference, the main difference between Moshe Rabbeinu and Bilam is the idea of finding the good. Whoever can find the good is worthy of being a Jewish leader. And by being a leader, this creates the Mishkan. The Mishkan is the source of the atonement of sins. Meaning what? No matter how bad, whatever a person may do in his life, how negative it is, if he works on finding the good, there's always hope. Rabbi Nachman, says, even if you see someone who appears to be a totally wicked person, Rasha Gamur, it can't be. How could it be that he never did a mitzvah in his lifetime? How, he never kept Pesach, he never kept Yom Kippur. The guy living 50 years, 40 years, and you say he's a complete sinner, he's a complete wicked guy. Him, there's no good. He should be burnt, he should be in hell. How could it be? He never did a good point. He must have done some good point. Moshe Rabbeinu is someone who is able to find and focus on these good points. Whereas the average person, he's overwhelmed by the bad. He's a trickster, he's a thief, he's a murderer, and this and that. Moshe Rabbeinu is the exact opposite. He's able to find the good. He doesn't deny the bad, he did bad, but he also did good. Yeah, but he did bad. He said, no, Moshe Rabbeinu said, but he did good. It's one good point. But you're going to deny the bad. We're not denying the bad. But look at the good. You want to help him to do tshuva? Look at the good. That was Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu, the exact opposite of Bilam, was just looking at the bad of everyone. The ayin ra'ayin, a bad eye, an evil eye. Moshe Rabbeinu was the exact opposite. 
and Moshe Rabbeinu merited because of that that he can be the leader of the school children that all the children in the world receive their pure breath from Moshe Rabbeinu the Gemara goes on to say, the Midrash goes on to say that the whole world stands on the pure breath of the Jewish school children children learning Torah, little children learning Torah the whole world exists in their merits because you have pure children who are untainted involved in, in saying words within a pure setup that enables the world to exist. Where does it come from? It comes from Moshe Rabbeinu. So Moshe Rabbeinu, the faithful shepherd, is directly connected to the Jewish children who are learning Torah in the world. So now the Midrash makes this connection also on, uh, how, what, on the word Mishkan. The word Mishkan means a tabernacle. But the word Mishkan also means a mashkon, a collateral. That the Mishkan is a mashkon for the Jewish people. The Mishkan is a collateral. Meaning what? That when the sins of the Jewish nation are too overwhelming, so then there's something taken instead. What was taken instead? The Beit HaMikdash. We have no longer the temple. We have no longer the tabernacle. That was taken instead because the sins were overwhelming. What does it mean the sins were overwhelming? It means that people were living in a time where their sins were strong and they weren't working to find their good points. Who were the ones to help the Jewish people to wake up to find the good points? The prophets. The prophets who kept on coming to the Jewish people, come back, there's hope, do tshuva, stop sinning, do good, and they were pushing away the prophets and they were continuing to do sin. That's what led to the destruction of the temple. How does it work? Luchar should be the opposite. If they're so bad, so the Mishkan should atone for their sins. The thing was that people who sin, they get conv convinced by their sins and their actions that they're really bad. If I'm doing such bad things, I must be really bad. And there's no good inside of me. So therefore, there's nothing to, nothing to hold on to to start again in life. Let's just continue. That's what causes the destruction of the, that's what caused the destruction of the temple. And obviously the Mishkan, which was continued in the, in the Beit HaMikdash. It's Sounds when people... Like what? Sounds like Christianity. Afterwards, you're going to explain to me your question because I don't understand at this point. We'll go in first. The, the, the Mishkan, it, I, I, know, I know what you're saying, the atonement. It's a Jewish idea, by the way. It's not from the, it's our idea. It's from the Torah. This exists. Kapara is an atonement. But One no is a place. Huh? But there's a lack of goodness within the person. But that, that comes, that, that is due to the person being convinced that the bad is at the upper hand. Where does that come from? from lacking faith in Moshe the faithful shepherd because Moshe the faithful shepherd which is the symbol of all the leaders all the true Jewish leaders they work to instill the Jewish people with hope start again grab whatever good you have and start again just an anal analogy of this idea it's so important in life there was once a fire in the city of Breslov in the Ukraine and after the fire Rav Nassim and his disciples, they were running, walking around to see, to see if they can help anybody. They saw one Jewish homeowner his whole, crying over the debris and the remnants, of the burnt remnants of his house. And he was sifting through, crying his eyes out, crying through the right remains of his house. What was he doing? He was looking to see if there's any good, useful pieces that he can find and salvage from the remnants to build his house again. So Rav Nassim said, you see what he's doing? That's how it is in life. When a person gets burnt to the end, what to do? Stop, start again, look for whatever I can to start again in life and to start now, I re to start again in life. This is how it is in life. Is that yet somebody burns a person to the crust to the end, what, do we, what, what's, what, what can you do? You have two options. Or to accept the situation, that this is the reality and there's no hope for me and this I might as well just be burnt totally. Or to salvage and to start again, visit Hashem, finding some good points and to build on that. But going back to what we're saying, this is due to the tzaddikim at this level of Moshe Raya Mehemna, the faithful shepherd, who was able to help people to find the good points. That's his job. Like a shepherd, the sheep, the children, it's connected, these ideas. But when people refuse to listen to the tzaddikim, so they're stuck. They're stuck, which is only a futile attitude, that there's no hope. And that's what led to the destruction of the temple. That was then. What now? So it says, the, the verse says in Shirashim, 
Al Mishkenot Haroim. It's a verse in, in Song of Songs on the Mishkenot, the tents of the shepherds. And the Midrash explains that when the generation is not worthy and they need an atonement, so Hashem takes an, a, a collateral. The, the, the collateral is the, the tents of the shepherds. Who are in the tents of the shepherds? The school children. The children are taken as a collateral for the generation when, when there's no atonement, there's no room for atonement. So Hashem says, Al Mishkin But before that, the Midrash says, first Hashem plucks out the tzaddikim, the, the roim themselves, the shepherds. If now the generation is not worthy, and they're not listening to the shepherds to come back, to start again, that there's hope, Hashem will accept you, the message of all the tzaddikim every generation. So as an atonement, Hashem takes away the mishkin al is a mashkon, a collateral, he takes the shepherds away. And if there's no shepherds, because they've been taken away already, so then the school children who are receiving the tents, Mishkenot Arim also means the tents of the shepherds, those who are in the tents of the shepherds with the Jewish school children, they're taken away as a collateral instead. But all this is due to what? It's rooted in what? In the idea that people don't look for the good. And it's understood that people don't look for the good if they're all alone. If now, when we face society and life and our struggles alone, for sure the chances are 99.99% we won't make it in finding the good. We need the shepherds, we need the tzaddikim to give us this power. We need Moshe Rabbeinu, who is the source of building the temple, and who from there receive the Jewish school children their breath, who sustain the whole world. It's from Moshe Rabbeinu who gives that light of hope of the good points. But when that's taken away, so then there's a collateral the loss of Jewish school children, the loss of the tzaddikim. But the rectification for this is basically the idea of starting again. Because there's a rule, Ein dor yatom. There's no such thing as an orphaned generation. That even though Hashem takes away from here, He plants here. Hashem doesn't take away tzaddikim until He first plants and brings to the world other tzaddikim. He doesn't take away Jewish school children until there are other Jewish school children to, to replace them. That's how it is. There's always hope. There's always something to start with and to connect with again. But this is the atonement though. When? When the, the, the judgment is too severe. So this is the, the atonement for that. This is basically in a nutshell the idea of Vaikra, Mishka, and Moshe Rabbeinu, the good points, the period of the children, and how it connects to the Parsha, and also what happened with Shemrach in this week. But Bezat Hashem, it all starts really with being positive. Being positive means to start again like a child. Okay, Aleph, little Aleph, I'm starting now again, fresh from scratch, I know nothing. That means basically letting go. Because the attitude of people in life, especially someone wants to come close to Hashem, is that it's a struggle. It's a struggle. I'm trying to come close to Hashem and I'm being faced with obstacles. And the obstacles make me very negative. Ugh, oh, I didn't get up this morning for my davening. Oh, I can't, I, I'm, not, I'm not serving Hashem like I should. I'm not saying the blessings properly. I'm not guarding my eyes. My muna is so tainted. That, who's talking like that? A person who wants to come close to Hashem, but the obstacles are preventing him. So the attitude is to be negative. And the danger of that is that a person becomes too negative and he has what's called chadishut adat. He falls in inside his consciousness into thoughts of futility. When that happens, chas shalom, a person must remind himself Still, there must be a modicum of good in what I did. For example, a person davened and his head wasn't there. So he says, ah, I must, I, my davening is garbage. Look, I daven, I don't know what I'm saying, the words. No, I davened at least. There are people who don't even daven at all. I at least daven. I find my head wasn't there. But I had a good intention. The fact that I take time out to say these words, that's a good point. Ah, my, my Shabbat was uh, uh, just terrible. Well, it wasn't the Shabbat atmosphere, it was screaming at the table and this. It better be no Shabbat's table. But you did Kiddush, you sat at the table, you had something. Meaning, everything that you do in relationship to coming close to Hashem, even if it's not perfect, there is a good point. You're going to need that in life when the push gets to shove and the negative just gets too overwhelming that a person says, I can't anymore. I can't anymore. I, I see it. it's not for me, Judaism. It's not for me to come close to Hashem. It's just overwhelming the negativity I'm being faced. I was much better off when I was not religious. I don't need this. I have no negativity, no thing. Just leave me alone. Let me live. Enjoy my life. 
that, you're, you're, that, that is obviously a wrong way of thinking because there's no purpose in just this world. Whereas a person now who sees things in light of the world to come and sees the purpose and the negativity, negativity comes to attack him, so then I need to activate looking at the good. I'm going to need that. I'm going to need that a lot. They have a joke in wrestling. They say every, there's 24 hours a day. One hour a day is Yom Kippur. You confess, Hashem, I did this, I'm far. Talking to Hashem, it's called Yit Bodidu, personal prayer. And telling Hashem, oh, I want to come close to you, but I have all these difficulties. I'm so far with this. One hour a day. And the 23 hours a day is pouring. Pouring is 23 hours. And Yom Kippur is one hour. That's the idea. And you can only, it, it works both ways. In order to really be happy, it works that you set aside the time to be able to do a Yom Kippur. And the opposite also, in order, in order to do a Yom Kippur, it, it depends on, it, it, you have to have a happy attitude when you're supposed to be happy in life. But in short, we need both. And in the main, this thing of finding the good is what a Jew is going to need more than anything else, is finding the good points in order to go on. Because that's where the Yitzhah attacks a person the most, making him cut out in his davening, stop with your yearning, stop with your, with your enthusiasm to come, to come back to Hashem, it's just a waste of time, you're not getting anywhere. That is the Yitzhah. Because he gives the person the attitude, it's all or nothing. It's all or nothing. Why that attitude? Because when a person received the light of Judaism, they gave him the attitude of all. He had a big light, an intensity, wow, this is Kedusha, wow, this is Shabbat, wow, this is the Torah, I'm in, I'm in, this is it, oh, I'm in. And then that light is taken away, so a person says, listen, it's all or nothing, I, I want that light again, I'm not getting it, so it's nothing. Chas doesn't look like that. It's now, I have to now salvage the little bit of good that I can to take that, because that's what Hashem wants us in the struggle. The struggle is to focus on the good points, to look at the good. That's what Moshe Rabbein was able to do for 40 days. Hashem said, look, they did that golden calf. But Moshe Rabbein says, but still, look, they, they left Egypt, they followed me, they, all these good points Moshe Rabbein was bringing towards Hashem for 40 days, these tiny good points, until he won, he won in the end. And this is the, the, the key for every Jew in Yiddishkeit, is, is to focus on the good. And every drop counts. If it's not 100, okay, it's 20%. If it's not 20%, it's 10, it's 9%, it's 1%, but it's something. And I'm happy with that. And I look at that good point, and I continue with that. And a person who is not ready to do that in life, he's going to have a hard time in life. Because his attitude is all or nothing, so for sure he's going to be stuck in the dead end. Whereas Moshe Rabbeinu teaches us every drop of good counts. From this, a Mishkan is built. From this comes the idea of the school children. All this again, that this is the gateway for tshuva. The key for tshuva, really, is tshuva out of joy, out of love, out of being happy, out of looking the value of my good. This is important. This is something, this is the key, this is the climax of coming back to Hashem, is by looking at my good points, and thus I can also find the good points in other people. But to do this, I need Moshe Rabbein, who's the one who builds the Mishkan. He's the one who's able to find the good collectively in all of Israel, which, caused, which led to the building of the Mishkan. This is the idea, Bizet Hashem. Now we're approaching Pesach, and Pesach is a, is a big light. It's Mamash, a big, big light. It says on the night of Pesach, the Kabbalah says, the Arizal explains that all the mochin is called, all the intellects are opened at all levels. You have a high, a real high once a year, and it's reflected in the Jewish attitude on the night of Pesach. The night of Pesach for every, everybody is a big thing. Religious Jews, non-religious Jews, everybody, more or less, they make an issue of the night of Pesach to do something. Because there's this big, big, big light out there, and it, they feel it, the Neshama feels it. So it's something big, but then the next day, the light is gone totally. We start from scratch, and we start counting what's called the Sreta Omer, from the night of the next day of Pesach until Shavuot. And if we're lucky on Shavuot, if we merit, not if we're lucky, if we merit and we invest enough, so on Shavuot we gain again that light that we had on Pesach, which was a taste of a light above our level. On Shavuot you earned it by the yearning, the countdown of the Sirat Omer, which is an expression of yearning, to get back that feeling, that awareness, that closeness that we felt on the night of Pesach, Shavuot is after yearning and davening about it, you earned it, you get it, it's yours. If you merit, okay, of course. 
That's the idea of Shavuot compared to Pesach. But now, a key idea of Pesach is Savlanut, patience. Patience in life, what we spoke about tonight also, the whole idea tonight is patience. That a person has no patience with himself because he sees how, how negative he is, how it, it's all dark, all black. But by finding the good, which is patience, to sift out the good points that requires patience, to hold on till I find something good in the situation, in me, that it could be worse, it, that requires patience. So there's a story, a famous story, but we'll say it again because the message is so powerful. A story that Rabbi Nachman told about a German beggar and a Jewish beggar who traveled together. And they were all year round, became very good friends, collecting food and money like this as beggars. Came before Pesach time, and the Jew got very excited. And his German friend said, why, why are you so excited? He says, you don't know, this is the one night of the year that I get a full meal. It's great. <laughs> it's the best night of the year that everybody's invited, right? All those who are hungry, come and eat. Everyone's invited, guests. And the table is filled with all types of delicious meat and chicken and, and, and nice tzimis and salads. And oh, it's unbelievable. And, 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 and potato salads and potato cook, all these funny dishes. It's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful night. And he said, you know what? You speak German, I speak Yiddish. It's very similar. I have an idea. I'll, I'll teach you how to be to act Jewish, and you also will be invited. You come with me, you'll be invited to somebody's house. He said, not a bad idea. So he taught him, the Jew taught the, the German, Kadesh, Urchatz, Karpas, Yachatz, the beginning of the Seder, how it works out, the beginning of the... But he skipped out, he forgot to tell him about Maror, the bitter herb. Uh, over the excitement of getting to the Matzah, Motzi Matzah, and in Korach Shulchan Orech to get to the Seuda, which is the set table, he skipped by accident and forgot to mention to him about the stage of the Maru. And by Ashkenazi Jewry, Maru is a bitter herb. It's the, it's the horseradish. It's very hot. It's very burning. Oh, So came the night of, of Pesach. They, they came together to one of the shuls in the villages that they were at the time. The Jewish beggar was invited by one family. The German who dressed up and acted like a Jew by another family. And he said, oh, we'll meet afterwards, okay? Have a good time. So they went to two houses, the German went to the house, he, he knew he was prepared, he stood up for Kiddush, Amen, Baruch Hu Shema, whatever. The said there, he knew, and he was just non-stop thinking, oh, I can't wait for that food, I can't wait. <laughs> when he came after a few uh, long hours of just saying the monkey, they take long with the children, each one says, Mani Shtana, and everything, and translating every word, and he's waiting, oh, when the food coming, fine, after an hour and a half, two hours, oh, finally, they wash, wash in their hands, Motzi, Matzah, oh! And he started eating the matzah out of joy, he couldn't wait. The matzah just opened his appetite with the wine, already two cups of wine. He said, I can't wait for the, for the food. Then he saw that they brought in a silver platter, a big type of herb that he never saw in his life. He never saw a horseradish. He said, what is this? What is this? He said, this is the meal? This is, this, this is what your friend meant? This is the spectacular meal my friend was telling me about? This bitter, this, this, this funny vegetable, I don't know, even know what it is. It must be something very rare. So they, they, the, you saw how the master of the house was cutting out carefully the pieces, and then they brought the silver platter to everyone to take their portion. He took a nice piece of horseradish because he thought it was something special. And when he put it in his mouth, after he said the bracha, amen, his mouth was burning. And he got up and he cursed them. He said, you, you nasty Jews, dirty Jews, all this wait, all this, all this waiting for this, for this bitterness, and he left. <laughs> and he went back to the shul to sleep on a bench and he was just very bitter and he waited and waited sleepy he slept and fell asleep out of the bitterness after many hours his Jewish friend came with a very full belly very satisfied he came and he said hey how was it how was your meal he said don't talk to me you dirty you fooled me you fooled me you whatever what is this what did you do you played a game on me he said what happened tell me what happened they served the silver, you told me a big meal, all this food, they had the silver platter with this, with this funny herb. I took a big piece of it and it burned my mouth. What is this? I said, ah, you fool. We just waited just a little bit of time. Right after that, they were brought out the, all the delicacies that I told you about. A nice meal of the soup and the borscht and the meat and the chicken. If you just waited a little. So Rinachman teaches, that's how it is in life. Before the jackpot comes, there's a little bit of bitterness. A little bit. Have to be too, it's up to you, you can make it a lot. And that's the test, to just accept it. He, he has an amazing statement, Rabbi Nachman. A person who's not willing to 
to suffer a little in life, and the end he's going to suffer a lot. You have to accept it. That's how it is. Maro comes before the Suda. That's how it is. It's not Maro after the bitter, it's not after the Suda. It's before the Suda. This is how it is in life. Is that this little bit of bitterness, what to do? Be patient. Hold on. Don't drop it. Don't, don't run away. Hold on. Take it easy. Wait there. Wait there and there. St stand where you are. Don't budge. Don't move. Wait. And then if you wait and they open the door, you get to sit in, you get the jackpot. That's how it is in life. Everybody knows this to be true. It happens again and again, repeats itself in our lifetimes on smaller scales, on big scales. But this is an idea that happens again and again and again. It's a test. But again, to hold on in the bitterness can only come if a person knows and believes that there's what worth, there's something worthwhile to wait for. There's something good waiting. And this can only happen if a person looks at the good. If he doesn't look at the good already, and then he's hit with a little bit of bitterness, so it's only normal that people drop everything. Yeah, I can't handle this, leave me alone. As if I don't have enough bitterness already, I need this also. <laughs> Shalom, goodbye, I don't need this. But this is for a person who's already negative, whereas the person who's able, the wording that Rabbi Nachman brings is the Pasuk, Azamra Lelokai Be'odi, I can sing to Hashem with my little bit of good. I'm, I'm happy with the little bit of good. Oh Hashem, oh! I have eyes, I have fingers, I'm able to move, I'm able to talk. Oh, thank you, Hashem. I have the gift of my my in, my innards working properly and everything. Other people don't even have this. Oh, thank you, Hashem. I was able, I have a keep on my head, to keep kosher. I have all these little tiny mitzvot, even though I'm not the biggest gaon, I'm not the biggest tzaddik and tamil chacham in the world. Still, I have these little bit good points. That is the main thing. That's what keeps a person uh, intact to hold on in the difficult situations. That's the key, that's the message of Pesach. Again, Pesach means Pe, the mouth, Sach, speaking. And you're able to express yourself. A person, a person who's sad and depressed doesn't talk, he's closed up, his lips are sealed tight with glue. He can't talk, he doesn't leave me alone, doesn't want to say anything. Whereas a person who's happy is talkative. Who's talkative normally? People are happy, they have a, they have a good, good feeling. How are you, what's going on? Who's like that when people are happy? As opposed to people who are sad and depressed, they don't want to talk to anybody. They just closed the... Uh, I saw like a, a little comic this week that there was a Rebbe and uh, he fell into a state of like depression, sadness in a way. So the wording, the wording in Hebrew is not like, like, it, like Hashem told Cain, Lama naflu panecha, his face fell. Why did your face fall, right? In other words, your face, when a person is sad, so their face falls, like he, he looks down, he doesn't want to look at people, he's full of shame, he just wants to hide. So there was a joke, there was someone, a, a joker, who wanted to make the Rebbe happy, so he went into his room and he had a candle, and he was searching on the floor. And the Rebbe says, what are you looking for? He says, they told me the Rebbe's face fell. I'm looking for the Rebbe's face. And he got him to laugh. Baruch Hashem. To always be happy. To look at the good points, to keep on going, to, to, through that we can keep on going with Hashem. And if a person keeps on going, so then they get him back everything he lost. To conclude with another amazing, amazing story, which is so powerful by me, at least personally, this story has helped a lot. That there was once a, a store owner, he was sent by robbers. They came, okay, to stick up. They took almost everything in the store and they left. He was so broken, but he saw that they, he, they didn't steal everything. He had some stuff, some stuff in the store. So he picked his feet up again and started again with what he had left in the store after they robbed him. He started his store again, and he, he put on for sale the items they still had. Robbers came again and stole even that. So what did he do? His wife agreed to sell her jewelry, that he should buy more merchandise and start again. And he did that. Robbers came again and stole a third time. And Mama, she, uh, how much did he buy for the jewelry? He had less to buy. So he had little tiny things, and he saw that having a store, is, it's, it's, you, can't, you can't pay the overhead. So he became a traveling salesman with a bag of all types of needles and pins and little tiny little toys and trinkets and everything. And we were traveling from village to village, selling his little wares, and even exchanging them for eggs and chickens. We can have what to bring back home to eat and everything. So he, while traveling, and, and collected some money, Again, he was set on a, by another robber. And he, this time he cried. He said, please, this is all I have left. This is all I have left. 
You know, I've been robbed every four times already. They took everything now. This is my the last things I have left. And the robber said, "Give it to me. Hands up. I'm going to blow your brains out if you don't give it to me." So he gave him the the, the sack, and the Jew was crying. The person was just crying. What what, what happened to me? What has befallen me? And then he heard noises, screams. He turned around. He saw that the horse with the the, the robber was riding on it went went crazy because of the weight of all the of the things on the horse and the, the by the positioning of the horse jumping up and down the robber fell off the horse and the horse unintentionally began to stamp with his feet on the head of the robber thus killing him so the man he went to retrieve his stuff that was stolen and already before the robber stole from him he had big bags attached to his his horse he opened the bags in the bags was everything stolen from him from the first robbery and the second. It was the same robber, in other words. The first, second, third, fourth, and now this final time, everything was returned back to him. Hmm. What's the message? Is that the Yetzara, he steals from you. He takes away this, takes away that. You ruined my marriage, you ruined this, you ruined my children, you ruined my health. I've lost all, so much. And, and But a person keeps on starting again, starting again what I can salvage, starting again. Which is a point where again the Yetzer attacks this time and there's nothing left to take now. He's taken almost everything and the person does the right thing. He cries to Hashem, help me. If, if he holds on doing the right thing, which is to start again, and then when there's nothing left, even to cry to Hashem, what, is, what else is there for me to do? So if a person does the right thing, doesn't give up, they give back to a person everything stolen. Plus interest, by the way. It's also interest. Because <laughs> the, the robber has to pay kefal. Because they have to play double, normally. So that is really how it is in life. If a person holds on, doesn't give up, they give back to him everything that was stolen. The only thing that he lost, all the potential good that he lost out on, oh, I could have been here already if I was able to this, like, all these things I could have had if it wasn't for these things that happened in my life, these terrible things that happened, these tragedies and this and that. I could have been where I would have been. If a person doesn't give up, he gets to all that, plus much more. Just the fact is that the majority of people have given up. They don't keep on looking because again, it's all dependent on the perspective. It's the attitude of people to look at the negative, like the al Sheikh says, the holy al Sheikh he says, the pupil of the eye is black. Hashem made it that the pupil looks black, even though it's, it's, it's a hole. But the appearance and sight comes from this little bat eye in the pupil which appears black. Which means it's the normal attitude of people to look negative. It's normal. That's a normal human tendency and trait to look at things negative. It has to be worked on. No one's born positive. Oh, great, life, rah, rah. No one's born like that. It's that it has to be built on that, uh, that a person can have a positive attitude in life. Because the, again, tendency is black. And to overcome the black by looking for the good. The good, you have to search for it. It's not there. It's not there in the open. You have to, like the guy in the, in the fire, he had to sift all the ashes and all the burnt items until he found the useful good items. That's how it is in life. You have to look for the good. After, all, after everything said and done, it's very fine and dandy we're talking about this. But when it comes to the Masa, this is something very difficult. It's very difficult to be positive. You can go to seminars and there's teachers and everything to be positive and everything. When people go home, we know that it's not easy. It's uh, then that something hits. That 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 came thing through my day. So because of that, again, we need in order to be positive, we need Moshe Rabbeinu today. The tzaddik, who is the level of Moshe Rabbeinu, the faithful shepherd today, who is able to build the mishkan with our good points to give us the fuel to be positive. On my own, forget it. I need tzaddikim. Moshe Rabbeinu, faithful shepherd, to be able to guide me, to give me the guidance to have the good points. We should be zochem through Pesach to have the light of Moshe Rabbeinu revealed at the highest level. And by having that, to have this positive attitude for all of life, Bezat Hashem, and that's making it Bezat Hashem. Right, right, right. Yeah, okay. Can I have two things to say? First of all, you know how you say that to look for the good points inside of us, we need to, to look for the Moshe Rabbeinu for half to happen. This is very much true, but there is something else that say that alone we can't reach to do anything and that we need to pray. And so sometimes by praying God, it helps us also to see the positive, but not only to pray a Kadosh Baruch Hu that is up in the sky, sometimes also to 
to pray to the neshama that is inside and to say, please help me to see the good because when we do only outside prayer, sometimes it works less than when we do inside prayer that we... That we that you mean that you should talk to yourself? We, yeah. We, we don't pray to ourselves, we talk to ourselves. No, because you have a sparkle of a Kadosh Baruch Hu inside of you. But when uh, you only... Yeah, wait I, I, I can't pray to myself though. I mean, so, <laughs> yeah. No, I mean... Stop to wait only for help from outside, but speedy that God can help you also from inside, not exactly. only from no, outside. That's clear, you understand what I mean? Yes, that's Can I say what I'm saying? You give no. me two minutes? Can I, <laughs> can I tell you a story of Rabbi Nachman? So there is this man, he lives on this field, and he has a beautiful house, and he has a, a well where he digs water, and so there is this donkey who's running, and up he falls into the well. And poor donkey, he looks up and he sees the sun and he's trying to climb, but he can't because his feet are not made to climb on the well. And he has his feet in the water and it's all dark. And so he screams, he do, uh, he do, he all, he all. And so, the, <laughs> and so the, the man is trying to pick him up, but he just can't. So he doesn't know what he's going to do because the well is like over because he can't dig water out of it and the donkey is going to wake up all the family. So he says, alright, so I'm going to bury him. So he begins and he takes water from the ground and he do it one, two, three, like until it's 30 times. And then <gasps> the donkeys jump out of the hole and he's like, what happened? And then God makes a miracle, he makes the donkey talk. And the donkey said, well, I was down, and my feet were in the water, and I was like so freaking scared, I didn't know what to do, I saw the light, but I couldn't reach it, I tried to climb, but everything was dark and not nice. And then he sent the earth on my back, and I was like, what, is it trying to bury me? And then what I did, I shook my body, and I stepped out into the earth, and every time he will send earth to me, I will just shake myself and get up on it. <laughs> and at the end of the day, it helped me to jump out of the hole. So it said that in life, same thing, wherever you're in a good place or you're in a bad place, then things come in life and they eat you, might it be Nisayon or people. Or you can just say, oh, how it's bad stuff happened to me. And then you just carry it upon your back and it makes you go lower and lower and like to, and to the down. Or you can use it and say everything is from God, everything is against the Torah, and shake it and use it and it brings you to a place so much higher that you weren't before that it becomes a help if you know how to use it. Mm. <laughs> you know what, I mean, salvation is an amazing point. The salvation is found in the obstacle itself. Normally in life, you, you think that the, like, the salvation is there, there, the Pasuk says, Ki karov the item is close to you. You don't have to go so far to search for the salvation. The, the, the key, what you need, is next to you, have, you. You don't see it, it's dark. So a person has to have that light come in, which is mainly through prayer, praying to Hashem, and then, then, then to see, oh, here's the switch, ah, and then all of a sudden things work out. Are you available for the Hello. Yeah, you're talking so much about the children that they're, they're untainted and they're free from sin. But the whole, the whole object of the Corbonos was that the people came, there was the sin offering or there was the guilt offering or the various offerings. Right. And they, the person that brought them had sinned right. and they became pure. Right. So what is what is it? Why is it needed for the for the for the children? Very good. Okay. The second question I have is: um, we were talking about Mo Moshe being the faithful shepherd, right. but yet, yeah, Aaron had on his side he had the con the whole congregation. Were, were, were close to him and when he died they depended more they him more. mourned him more yeah. yet yet M Moshe was um, you know pleading with with God for for for, for, the, for this you know so uh, this you know he, he said that he had he had more dim you know he had more Moshe, dim. Moshe had more dim <laughs> and it, was not as connected with the people. Um, and thirdly, why is it that Hashem didn't forgive the <coughs> Jewish people completely for the golden calf? Because it said that the 
generations, generations, uh, you know, all the generations will, will have to pay, pay the price. Every suffering has it, and it mixed a little bit of the punishment for the golden calf. It's yeah. mixed and we're talking about the Sadiqim as well. It's, it seems to me that in our generation, that so many Sadiqim, you know, famous Sadiqim are now no longer with us. The, you know, the, the, the you know, the Nechman, the Lubavitcher Rebbe. It seems that they were, they were, we're in, uh, we're looking for, you know, we're, 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 we're following the footsteps of those that have passed on. Right, right, right. It's a lot of questions. Let's see if I remember. <laughs> Let's go back to number one. When a person brought a sacrifice, he's doing an exchange. The person sinned. The sacrifice is going to now take the imprint of the sin onto the animal. All right? We're going to do an exchange. In order to do that, the animal has to be pure already. I'm not going to take an item which is already problematic. <laughs> And now put my sins, because we have to do what's called smicha, the man who confessed his sins on the animal. By doing that, he transferred, so to speak, his sins onto the animal. And then they sacrificed the animal, so that, that was the atonement. In order to do that, that, the animal has to be pure. It can't be just a regular animal, it's a pure animal. Right. That's why these animals are called pure. Shows chose specifically the cow, the sheep, the goat, the... the, 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 the the, the, the yona, the dove, and the, the, the taurim, the second type of, uh, of dove, turtle right, turtle dove. These are, Hashem said, these are pure animals in their makeup, how they are. You can use them to transfer afterwards an atonement. So the children also, we said, are an exchange, chas mm -hmm. When there's sins, so, and, and the generation is not worthy enough, so it goes on to school children. That's the idea. That's what we mentioned. It's a mashkon. Yeah. That's, a, that's what's scary. That's, that's a scary thing. We have to avoid that from happening. Avoid that from happening. There's another way to avoid that is by that my, that my lips, that my prayers be instead of my sacrifices. In other words, I, that I do tshuva before having to actually bring an animal. That I do the davening, because today we can do that. That's what we do, our davening. And where Davini corresponds to the sacrifices. There's the morning prayer, which is the connected to Tamit Shachar, the morning the sacrifice. And Mincha is, is connected to Tamit Shabin Ermai, the, the afternoon sacrifice. So when we're not doing Davini properly, we're not doing what we can to, to affect atonement, so Chas Shalom is used on the school children. So that's the idea, the connection of the children, the pure, and the animals being pure. That's the purity there. Uh, you mentioned so many items, I, I lost track. What was number two? Okay, fine. So Aharon, very good, no, very good. Thanks, thanks for the recall. I'm sorry, is there another level of understanding the exchange child? The ex exchange children, uh, what, the story? Yeah. Uh, not, I don't know, because in the exchange children, there was an exchange. That, uh, and afterwards, the exchange was reverted. But here when children are taken away, plucked out, and they're, no, they're not here long, no longer, how can we say there's an exchange to come back? Mm -hmm. The exchange children is that a person comes in the world, and the Yetzirah is trying to tell a person, you're a slave, you're not a, you're not, you're not, you're not a child of the king, you're a, a slave. And I, I, my job in life is to work to get out of that. I said, no, I'm a Ben Melech. There's a song given, Yehudi Hu Ben Shemelech, a, a, a Jew is the son of a king. That, that to have that attitude is only if I can find my good points. All the morning blessings, by the way, all the that all the the, the Berkot Shachar is basically mentioning the good points. Blessed are you, Hashem. Right? Alkin Mechalam. Shelo Asani Goy. Shelo Asani Avet. Right? Shelo Asani Kirtzono. And Rokar Tzalamayim. All the blessings that I say in the morning are the good points that I see in my life. I'm pleasing Hashem. Who gives the, the, the rooster the ability to, to, to differentiate between darkness and light? These are all good points we're mentioning at the beginning. And the Yitzhak wants to break that, and that no, you're a slave, you're down. That can lead afterwards, Chas Shalom, that uh, we lose it. Uh, in a way, it's connected. I just, <laughs> it's a long, it's a bit, it could be connected to what you're saying. It could be. I'm, I'm thinking about it now. It could be the exchange of children with the exchange of the children. But now, the Aaron, we have to explain. This week's parsha talks about the midrash tzav, about the appointment, the official appointing of Aaron and his sons. Aaron wore the eight vestments. 
and uh, Rashi brings down that each garment atones for another sin. Now, the garments are made from what? Fabrics, gold, metals, stones, which were part of the donations of the Mishkan. In other words, like we said, the good points that the Jews initiated by giving a, the donation towards the Mishkan went in also to the makeup of the garments of Aaron Akoin. So, the Midrash concludes that the garments of the Kohen Gadol and the sacrifices accomplish the same thing. Just as the, the, the animals do atonement for whatever, all the types of sacrifices, a sin offering, a birth offering, a peace offering, all the types of offerings, whatever they come to do what they have to do, a rectification and atonement, so do the garments of the Kohanim and the Kohen Gadol also do that. Now, Aharon was chosen to, to wear the vestments and to be the Kohen and not Moshe Rabbeinu. Aharon, believe it or not, in a sense, is considered like a disciple of Moshe Rabbeinu, which is amazing because he was older than Moshe Rabbeinu. He was already a prophet, yet Aharon bent himself totally to his younger brother, which is why he merited to be able to be the Kohen Gadol, because of his Bito, that he was a great person, and yet was able to bend himself to Moshe Rabbeinu. So he earned to wear the, the vestments of, of, uh, of, of the Kohen Gadol. But really, all of the power of Aharon was through Moshe Rabbeinu, because he was still receiving from Moshe Rabbeinu. So on the revealed level, all the Jewish people, they mourned over the loss of Moshe Rabbeinu, of Aharon more than Moshe Rabbeinu, because he's the one who was able to go out and make peace between husband and wife, between friends, to go out and to make the peace. But that was on the revealed level. Wow. Where we, we, he was receiving it from Moshe Rabbeinu. Number, that's number one. Number two, when Moshe Rabbeinu did, passed away, they didn't mourn him oh. as much. The Torah, the Torah doesn't make a big story of the mourning of Moshe Rabbeinu when he passed away, but of Aaron, the, the Torah makes a big story of his passing. Not, not initially. Uh, However, okay. when Joshua passed away, and Joshua <coughs> reflected the light of Moshe Rabbeinu, he was the true disciple, he was like the moon, which reflects the light of Moshe Rabbeinu, then retroactively the Jews mourned really the loss of Moshe Rabbeinu. They felt the loss of Moshe Rabbeinu when Yoshua passed away. So now, Aharon and Joshua, they contain, they contain similar factors, similar, similar elements, and that they're both considered like students of Moshe Rabbeinu. So now the student is someone needed in the picture of the tzaddik. Because the tzaddik is someone big, he, can bring down, he brings himself down to people, but still, not everyone can connect directly to the tzaddik because of the intensity of the light. He said, it says that the, the face of Moshe is compared to the face of the sun, and the face of Joshua is like the face of the moon. I can't stare at the sun at midday. It's too bright. I need shades. The shades is like the light of the moon, where it's now filtered and I can receive properly at my level the light of the, of, of this, of this, of the sun. So too, Moshe Rabbeinu was the, was the faithful shepherd, was the leader, but there's many levels of people who receive from Moshe Rabbeinu, and there's some people who want to receive Moshe Rabbeinu, but, but they need a bit of a, an extension to help them. This Hashem created that there's tzaddikim and their disciples. The Talmidim help to dispense and spread out the teachings of the tzaddikim. So there was a Moshe Rabbeinu, but he had disciples, especially Aaron and especially Yoshua, who were able to dispense the message of Moshe Rabbeinu for every single Jew. So in that sense, the students reveal more at, at, at levels, at, at morsels that I can grab at my level the teachings of Moshe Rabbeinu. This explains now why they mourned more Aharon when he passed away and Yoshua when he passed away more than Moshe Rabbeinu because it's there, he, he's giving them, he's feeding them the initial light on the, on the hidden level, on a the, on the deeper level. But what we see, people who are tiny, they need to receive from the, from the disciples. But it's all from Moshe Rabbeinu. I hope that was clear. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, 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 two more questions. <laughs> in the meantime, there's another question. Though. I want to answer him. Yeah, do you remember? Can, 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 you know, I don't remember. So can I answer? Can I try to give an answer? Hey, what's the question, mind? though? What's the question? For the two questions that he gave, the first two. Can I have, I have a bit of different answer? Can I try still? I don't know. Cool. It's a, okay. Thank you.
I get cool. So for you know for the children that learn Vayikha, this is what I say. This is my opinion. Maybe it's not cool, but I think in Vayikha with the covenant and everything, we learn also the Truva. And I think Truva is like one of the first things to learn when you're a human being because you're gonna fall. So it's important to know that even if you're gonna fall, then there's a way to, to get back on it. And uh, this is cool, cool answer? Cool, it is cool. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and the second one was Aaron and Moshe. But I think Moshe was oh, such a tzaddik, but he was, you know, such enlightened. And he was not, you know, we don't, he was not doing so much of it. Like, he was very bright and very everything. And when you are, like, near to a big, big, big tzaddik like him, you can't really, like, picture yourself as him because he's so high, you know? So you can't really feel close to him or, or seem like a mirror because, wow, he has so much. But Aaron says sometimes God he makes big tzaddikim to fall because when big tzaddikim they fall sometimes then you f then they feel more at your level and you feel more at their level and then when they do the shuva then you feel hey if I can do it then I can do it too and then after it helps you to go back up so Aaron he was also here to help us to do shuva because we needed somebody at our level to be able not our level because it was much more big but the fact that he was with the people that he didn't let us sin alone that he kept with us, then after he was able to pull us out also of Tshuva, and if he was not here, then Moshe, he was not sinning with us, you know, so we needed him to help us to do Tshuva, I think, afterwards also. The question, the question I had was, uh, why is it that, uh, you know, like, like um, Rabbi Nachman and... Uh, and some people passed away. Passed, there are a lot of passed away now, and right. we're, we're, we're searching for the... Um, tzaddikim. Tzaddikim. Right. We're searching for the Tzaddikim. Tzaddikim pass away and yet at the same time continue to be alive mm -hmm. through the disciples and through their teachings. Right. So there, there is a, a makkah, a punishment that the tzaddikim are the exchange. Al mishkinot haroim, that Hashem takes as a collateral the shepherds. That's at one level. But tzaddikim are always alive. The Gemara says, tzaddikim be mitatam kiruim chayim. Tzaddikim in their passing are always considered alive. How could it be? He passed away. Would he give it to me that he that he's still alive? So how is it that Sadiq can continue to be alive through his disciples, which is what we mentioned, the idea of Aaron Yoshua. It just happened that Aaron passed away before Moshe. But Yoshua not. Yoshua passed away after Moshe Rabbeinu. So that is a continuation of the of the Tzadikim if we look for the disciples and the teachings, the writings, the Sfarim, the books, to learn. To learn the teachings and to connect to the disciples of the Tzadikim. This gives us a, a connection that even after the tzaddikim have been plucked away, yet we can connect to what's called the Rishimu, the impression left by them, which is strong enough to give me the koach to continue going on in life. Even today? Even today, especially today, especially after their passing. So the, the, the passing away is on one level. It's on the revealed level. So people who live a superficial existence they're very influenced by the passing or the death of this rabbi, the death of this person, so they feel all alone. That's on the review level for people who live superficial, for people who live with a strong emunah, that Hashem is always there, the Torah is eternal, Moshe Rabbeinu is eternal, Moshe Emet, Hashem Emet, Moshe Emet, Torah Torah Emet, that Hashem is truth, meaning it's from Aleph, Mem, Tav, it's from beginning to end, from the beginning to the very end, Hashem is always going to be there. Torah Emet, the Torah is also from the beginning to the end. And Moshe Emet, Moshe also, as said from beginning to end, will always be there. With that attitude, you can always have what to hold on to. To find the tzaddikim, what they left behind, the disciples, the svarim. And also, in the meantime, like we said, new tzaddikim arise, visit Hashem. Like we're waiting for the, the one and only Mashiach. He's going to be the ultimate tzaddik, visit Hashem. So is there a reason why um, Hashem didn't forgive us completely for the golden calf is because he wants all the generations preceding to 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 do two. Uh, the the repetition of the, the the continuation of the punishment for the golden calf is simply because every generation we repeat the blemish of the golden calf, which is what to make an intermediary. When a Jew doesn't rely on Hashem alone and relies on maybe I have to I should I have to, I have to make a business if I, if I don't make a business Hashem's not going to sustain me I have to go see a doctor if I don't see a doctor Hashem's not going to heal me or a person puts an attitude that he makes the siba the means as the main thing that without the means Hashem can't help you and he believes that 
there is an attitude that Hashem helped me and Hashem pushes you to do something. You feel you're, you're taking a passive mode and Hashem sends you to open a business. He sends you to do this. Hashem is guiding you because you asked for it. That, that we're not talking about. That, that's where Hashem wants to help you through a means, but He's pushing you to do the means. Whereas other people, we spoke about this a few weeks ago, that they make a, a big, big noise. How do you expect Hashem to help you if you're, if you're just a, a, a parasite and a free loafer and you don't go to get an education, you go to university, you don't, know, you, don't, you don't build yourself. How do you expect Hashem to help you? Which is like the attitude of many parents when their children do tshuva and they, they drop everything to learn Torah and say, how are you going to survive? How are you going to live? And all this. That attitude is a blemish of the golden calf. Is that they made an intermediary, in, they believed in Hashem, the golden calf, they believed in Hashem. But they needed someone, Hashem yet khulifanim, they said. We need some, someone, an idol, who will go before us. We believe in God, but we can't connect him, he's too far from us. We need some intermediary. So Rabbi Nachman explains this parallels when people use the excuse of work or doctors of medicine as a means which is so strong that without it, Hashem can't help you. That's not true. Hashem can help you with or without a means. It says that Hashem, for His reasons, pushes you to do the means, to use the means. But you, in, in being involved in the means, you have to remember that it's only a muna. You just, you're involved like with very passive. I know, I open this store, I go to a doctor, I did that. Everything is very like, no, I'm, not, I'm not into it. I'm just doing it because Hashem is sending me this as the means that He wants. My head is connected to Emuna, to Hashem, that He's the healer, He's the source of everything. Because many people have that problem, and it's understood, but it's a test that in this world where which everything is concealed, and we see how the world runs according to the laws of nature, chas shalom, so people get carried away to repeat the blemish of the golden calf, that no, that this world is what runs things to get move, moving. You have to work, you have to be healthy, you have to do things, and if you don't, then you're going to die, chas shalom. Whereas really, it's Hashem is guiding, Hashem is the one who sends you everything you need in your life. But that attitude of losing it and forgetting is a repetition of the golden calf, which causes all the suffering that comes afterwards over the generations, which is why it has mixed into it a punishment of the golden calf, because in essence the punishment coming now is because of a repetition of again doing things which caused the golden calf to happen in the first place. The people used the intermediary as a big thing. That's the punishment. It's like also the excuse of the of the reform Judaism in Germany. What was their excuse? What was it? They say we're tired of being oppressed and, and outcast because of what the what Napoleon introduced, and even before German society, that now there's equality, liberty, that everyone can be equal now, that the Jews can be accepted. That's it. Let's do away with the Jewish traditions, Jewish religion. Let's now adapt it. That was due again to the cause that this this is what runs the world. Whereas really, it's Hashem, you doing good, doing mitzvot, not speaking Lashon Hara, not doing Averot. And when this punishment is because of that, because of the sins that I'm doing, because of the, the negativity. And, and, and the, attitude, the, ne- the, the, the negativity, the, the sins is because a person gets carried away and forgets that Hashem is running his life. So again, it's like a circle in a way. It's a circle in a way that the golden calf repeats itself, the sin which is the reason why there is some types of punishment and has mixed into it the punishment of the golden calf into it also. Well, it would seem... Uh, well, wait, 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 and, and listening to what the Tzadikim say, you know, yes. the, the Arizal, special. Yes. Rambam, yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> Rabbi Nachman. Right, that's what he said. It's, it's, it's when you learn it, learning and it from the Tzadikim. Right, because uh, they're not here. The Tzadikim are not here physically. What did they leave behind? They left behind two items. Their students and their books, their teachings. Some of the students are done. What? Some of the students are done. So that's why we have to find Tzadikim today. We have students that are still here. We have today, physically, we have, so so first of all, the Pirkei Avot, the transmission of the Torah, Moshe Kibbil to Rami Sinai, Moshe received the Torah from Sinai, handed it down to Joshua, Joshua to the elders, elders down, and then the Rambam extends it and he goes and explains all the generations 
from Moshe Rabbeinu until the closing of the Talmud, all the way down. There's like 50 generations there. And till today, every person who teaches Torah received from somebody, not just from books. You can't now be an online rabbi, you know, I'm an online, I learned, like, I took a course online on how to teach Torah. It doesn't work like that. You have to have contact with human beings. <laughs> Or it's funny, it sounds funny, but it's, it's unfortunately true. Yeah, of course, take an online course how to be a teacher in Torah and everything. But you need a live person, you know, like an online order to learn books, and that's it. You have you did a book course. And it doesn't work like that in Judaism. It's two parts. It's the Tzfarim and the people. You can't just now be a, a, a Jewish person just from books. You have to have contact with physical teachers, scholars, people. So you need both. There's Poisik. There's Poisik. Right. But in the Jewish trend, you have teachers of halacha, and you have teachers of musar, of ashkafa, of, of true of ideas to come back to Hashem. So that these are these are in a sense community. So we have to stick to these. You have to stick to the people and the books also. You have you have to have there's a balance. You can't just now bother a rabbi all day long and listen to the classes. You have to also open the Gemara, you have to open Mishnah, you have to open the Rambam, open Arizal, open Chassidun, you have to open the Sfarim, you have to learn also. You have to learn also, you have to learn also, you have to also learning Sfarim. But people, you need both. It's the two things, it's the balance. But you have connection directly to the, yes, that's what it seems, yes. Is that less continuous? It's end, till today, till today. Do you know there's a guy who was part of the diaspora band? His name is Ben Sion Solomon. Ben Sion Solomon. So he was learning in the diaspora yeshiva, and he uh, decided to come close to Breslev. So the Rosh Hashim was very upset. He says, you know, you're just starting a new trend. There's a transmission. I received. And he started going from all his rabbi, 50 generations up, going up. I received from this rabbi, I received from this rabbi, everything all the way from the Nitzi of the Vilna Gaon. He kept on going up and up and up and up. And now you're going, you're going off. I want to give over to you also what I received. <laughs> He's like, there's a, there's a transmission. There's a transmission. There's a transmission. It it's, another, it's another good. class. It is, it's one second. It's another class, but there's what's called Sadiqim. And there's what's called Sadiqim Amitim. True Sadiqim. Sadiqim of the generation. And that is a different... Uh, we can't go into it now. That'll be another four hours, whatever. We can't go on uh, forever. Mm -hmm. But that's another idea of to find specifically tzaddikim of this generation. There are many tzaddikim, there were many tzaddikim, mm -hmm. but I need to find the tzaddikim and the disciples and the teachings of Dafka, the present day tzaddikim. Yes. We've had that class. Right, we right. did have the past. Okay. So it's, it's posted. It's posted, it's posted. It's posted. posted. yeah. Go to, go, to, go to Center on Facebook. Great. That's the class. Mm -hmm. There should be a list of all the classes. And what they're about. <laughs> <laughs> Some, really quick yeah. All right. Um, yeah, more questions. Right. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah I want to ask a question about what you said about um, trusting that God, Hashem is going to guide you instead of just using your own belief that you need to get a job or you need to do this. Right. Well, if you're all your, you pray in, in the Shema Nasser that you know, God gives you insight and, and knowledge, and so your, your thoughts are coming from God, so how do you discern the difference between a thought that comes from your own, I should do this versus Beautiful. something God if, it's, if you know that it's a result of davening, there's a person who uses intuition and he didn't daven about it, and there's another person who gets intuition and he did daven about it. To explain an example, Rav Nossin had a son, Rav Yitzchak, who, I think I mentioned this maybe, he, had a, he was in charge of the post office, which was also the local bank, and he took upon himself a new devotion. He had a chavuta who he very much loved, who was very poor, his name was Rav Mordechai, and he decided this Rav Yitzchak, whenever he bought for himself something, he would buy the same item for his friend. And if he didn't have enough money to buy both, so he wouldn't buy it for himself. So if he once bought a fur, co a fur coat for himself and for his friend, because he, he didn't have enough money, he didn't buy himself a fur coat. So was, he told his father about his avodah, and Rav, Rav Nassim said like this, if you came to do this out of your, out of davening, then would you daven to Hashem, and this is the idea that came out, because you wanted to do this, and you asked Hashem guidance, and this is what came out, I envy you. But if it came just from your svara, and your way of thinking, and your intellect, and your thoughts, I would envy your emotion. Because it came through Emuna, I'm interested in it. It's like an example I brought, I think, about Rabbi Yeva Sava in the Zohar. This Rabbi Yeva Sava, he would have a set table food for ready, ready to eat. But before eating, he would turn and ask Hashem, Hashem, send me food to eat. Please help me to have food. Please send me. I have nothing, I have nothing. And then he would sit down to eat. Because he wanted the eating to come through Davini. 
Even though he had the food and everything, wow. but he did. He wanted to come about through davening. When we're davening in the Shimon Esra, if you're davening it and you mean it, and then you see Chochma Bina and Dad in your life because of the davening, that's great. But other people, from the beginning, it's me, I'm, a, I'm an intellectual person, I'm a smart person, I make decisions in life and everything, watch it. That's a, that's a danger, danger zone. Everything through Emunah. Everything has to be through Emunah. Life is like the letter Hey. In the letter Hey, you have a Dalit and a Yud. Dalit, the Zohar says, refers to Emunah. Because Dalit is like in Hebrew, Delekla, Migar Makrun. Dalit, Emunah has nothing of its own. What's Emunah? It's not, it's not, you believe in something. In itself, it's intangible. I believe. I believe. In what? I believe in Hashem. But in itself, it's empty. It's like a receptor. It's a receptacle. It's a receiver. And Muna is the receiver to receive everything that you believe in. You believe in the power of Hashem that He's guiding. So that's the, the Muna is your your vessel to receive from Hashem what you need. What's the Yud? Rashi explains Yud is Chokhmah, wisdom. It's like a dot. It's solid. Boom. It's a dot. It's an idea of wisdom. The letter He, we take the wisdom. And we put it in the Dalit. That's what makes the letter here. You have the Dalit, the area of the Dalit, and I put into it the U, which means that all your wisdom, you have to put it into Emunah. In other words, Emunah has to be the base, and in that I'm putting my wisdom. In other words, I'm developing my brain, learning Gemara, learning Torah, becoming somebody, but in the basis of Emunah, as opposed to somebody who they train from the beginning develop, become educated, become intellectual and everything, and there's no Muna, there's no Dalit, there's no Hey here. It's danger. It's dangerous. Zero. Yud Dalit is, uh, is, is uh, work. Yud yeah. And also, Yud Dalit is uh, Pesach also. <laughs> it's also Pesach, yes. yes. And just uh, talk a little bit about, if you get a thought, let's say, yeah. and it's, it's not a total value thought. <laughs> uh, something comes in, it's not in accordance to Torah or Hashem's, uh, you know, Hashem, what Hashem would want for you. Something uh, from the dark side, let's say. Yeah, and therefore, yeah. Uh, you have to clap. To, you have to uh, fight it. Differentiate, you, you have to recognize it. Yeah, but the only way to recognize is by learning halacha. When we spoke, learning halacha gives the Jew the ability to navdil bein kodesh l'chol. Learning Torah, which is the separation of what's per permissible and forbidden, what's pure, what's impure, what's holy and what's unholy, that's what halacha does. It causes that you can see in life clearer. But again, it's rooted, halacha, da'at is rooted in the moon also. It's rooted in the moon. I'm learning halacha, I'm learning the Torah, because I believe in Hashem, I want to connect to Hashem. Hashem all they can understand. And this is what Hashem wants me to do, is learning Allah. That's why I'm learning Allah. So it's a branch of wisdom which is rooted in the moon. But this learning of Allah gives a person the ability to differentiate between the good and the bad. There's a story. <laughs> we can go on another hour. Right? Yeah, there's a story of a, I think I mentioned this story. There was a, a, a young Torah scholar learning day and night, learning day and night. Mamash was Mamash learning, all, was all, all learning. And he merited that a Magid, an, an angel came to speak to him words of Torah. When he did not know that this Magid was not from the side of holiness, it was from the side of the tomb of the purity. It wasn't a real, it was a demon who came to reveal Torah, yes, to reveal Torah, and he was amazed. So then this Magid, this angel, this demon told him, you and your wife are such a holy couple, you are going to bring Mashiach in this generation. But it requires one thing, that you cohabit at the time when your wife is forbidden to be with. So he was amazed after hearing the Torah from this angel, and he says, you're going to be Mashiach? He was so convinced that this is the truth. So he told his wife about it. His wife had some more common sense. She said, wait a minute, let, let me think about it. Her father was a big Rosh Hashiva. In other words, the, the Rosh Hiva took for his daughter this Tamit Chacham. That's why, he took, why, that's why he took him to marry his daughter, because he was such a Tamit Chacham. The Rosh Hashiva, he knew Kabbalah, and he, but also he understood that if now this demon is asking him to transgress the Torah in order to bring Mashiach, and he gave arguments, just like Boaz and Ruth and Yehuda and Tamar, so to now to bring final Mashiach, you have to do the same thing. So it's okay, so it's in line with the, with the positioning of how Mashiach is supposed to come, go ahead and do it. So he had doubts in it, because this Rosh Hashiva knew Kabbalah, so he knew how demons looked when they're real and when they're not. When, they're, when it's a real Magid, a good angel, or when it's a demon, he knew. He asked the son-in-law to come in and he said, listen, 
I want to tell you something. Next time you speak to this Magid, look on his forehead. You should see three letters. Aleph, Mem, Tav. If all three letters are shining, then this is a holy angel. And yes, you can listen to what he's telling you. But if now only the Mem and Tav, Met, dead, is shining, and the Aleph is not shining, then know that he's a demon. And when he realizes that you've uncovered the real truth that he's a demon, he's going to attack you. So I'm preparing for you all types of what's called amulets, kamiot, preparing for you. So when he attacks you, have these amulets on you so he won't attack you. So the next time the, mag the, the Magid came along and he saw that on his forehead was only Mem and Tav shining. And he realized that it was a demon and therefore everything he said was not kosher. And then he attacked him and he braced for attack but he had these amulets protected. him. But the idea of the story is, <laughs> he was asked to do something which is against the Torah. She had common sense, the wife, to realize it's not kosher. Why? Because it goes against the Torah law. Shulchan Aruch. Once Rabbi Nachman said also, in, in life, in Judaism, you can, you, can, you can fly. You want to take Torah ideas and make them psychedelic and, and have a nice ideas of the Torah. I find it dandy. Just don't budge from a single section of the Code of Jewish law. Then you know you're okay. If now your fancy schmancy Torah ideas and insights and everything they bring you to go against Torah law, then know you're not on the right path. Know there's something wrong with your Torah ideals. Therefore, it's necessary for every Jew to know, to make sure that their Torah perspective is kosher, to learn halakha, learn Torah law to know what's okay, what's not okay, and within that parameters to go around. Hasidic teachings, they do that by the way. They take the imagination, they make you run, they make you fly, they take Torah ideas, and show you all these amazing things, but they don't budge from the Shulchan Aruch. That's the beauty. They think there's all these beautiful ideas and concepts and everything, and uh, that's why it's very attractive, the ideas of Hasidut. Because people today have a wild out imagination. It's only normal in such a generation with Hollywood and everything. So the imagination is already wild. It's, but we need it to be grounded. It's within the parameters of the Torah. And that's the beauty of the Hasidic teachings. Right. Yeah. Uh, it, it would seem... Okay. Um, uh, this is so beautiful that there's always a uh, possibility of renewal and, and, uh, and rebirth uh, right. for us. But for the Gaia, it's the exact opposite. Until they see the futility and the complete dissolution. <laughs> exactly. Then oh, they wake up. Only then they can wake up. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. It's the exact opposite. Right. Because we have a complete reversal. We, we, we have hope. As a, the, the meaning of the Jew is, you, is, is, etern is eternity, it's eternal. We're connected to something eternal. Hashem is eternal. The Torah is eternal. It's something eternal. That means there's always hope. It can never burn out. And every Jew has that spark, the, the holy spark, like she mentioned earlier. Chelek Elohim Imam, the part of divine, part of Hashem within us. And that therefore, there's always hope within us. Hashem. There's always hope. So to bring it out. Well, within them, there really is no hope. There is no hope. Until, until they realize it. Exactly. Exactly. Bad things that happen right. throughout the years. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. A little question. I saw the little Aleph and then Vayikra, but when you were talking about it, it yeah. sounded as if the Aleph was at the end of the word. It is. And that Vayikra. Me. Why, is it, why was it printed at the beginning? Why wasn't it printed at the beginning? It was at the beginning. When I saw it, um, yesterday it was yeah. the little Aleph, and then the word Vayikra. No, no, it's at, how the, how it's it at the end of the word. Nice. Yeah. Do you have a homage? Yeah, the, <laughs> I, 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 well, I always the, the, the first verse, the first chapter is Aleph. I swear. It's the big oh, thing I in that? the chapter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really chapter one, verse one. So there's two Alephs. Oh. There's a big Aleph, and there's another Aleph, and then there's one. <laughs> <But> my <laughs> teacher said the little Aleph, I was looking. No, in the word itself, I could take a look at the whole yeah, yeah. You yeah. see that yeah. Aleph is small. Okay, yeah. afterwards, afterwards. All right? All right. So, so, uh, everyone have a beautiful Pesach. Hashem, we should be to have the Beit Hamidash, and we should do the Korban Pesach in the Beit Hamidash.